can't say that is hello, hello and Cree. Cree. My name is Tiana. My name is Matthew. And, and we're, we're the, the Galactic, Galactic Hot Dogs. Dogs. We would like you to travel back in time with us a bit and see how the indigenous people lived and survived in this beautiful land in what is now Alberta. We decided to do a deep study of the indigenous people pre-contact. Now, we only have a limited amount of time to present some fascinating and cool information about these wonderful, knowledgeable people. So we decided to only cover the three groups that lived in some part in what is now Alberta. That would be the Plateau, Plains, and Mackenzie First Nations. This is an indigenous camp we made, which shows the people and some of the different activities that would have taken place in pre-contact Alberta. In this slideshow that we shared with you, you can click on the following images with the purple star and it will take you to a more in-depth presentation. Let's start in the transportation department. Transportation was vital for their survival. They built the best modes of transportation with the materials that they found in their environment. They built beautiful canoes for different types of waterways. Birch Park was the best, as our slideshow explains. They made snowshoes, travois, and even toboggans for land. Matthew, you love tobogganing. Oh yeah. Now, let's warm up a bit and talk about the different structures that they lived in. These are some of the different structures that the indigenous people lived in. There were teepees, tool mat lodges, lean-tos, and pit houses. The structure they lived in was determined on how they lived. Were they always on the move, following their food? What climate did they live in? And what materials they could find in their environment? Now, Matthew had the experience of helping to build the teepee at Fort Edmonton Park. How did that go? Great! Till it got a sliver, and oh, what a sliver it was. Some interesting information we learned at the Cree camp at the Flying Canoe Festival was that if you were to have asked a Cree person about their teepee, they would have had no idea what you were talking about. The correct Cree word in pre-contact times for teepee was miigwap. Cool. Now, let's talk about the people. All individuals were important for their tribes. Let's start with the roles of the men. The men generally hunted, fished, and went to war. The women generally cooked, made clothing, cared for the children, put up the structures, and prepared animal hides. The children did have chores. They worked daily with their parents who taught them how to survive. Some babies were even taken to work with their mothers. Mom would love that. Some mothers used cradle boards and carried their children with them everywhere. The cradle boards were comfortable and did have safety features. This really shows us how much the mother loved and cared for her child. A fascinating fact that we learned at the Royal Alberta Museum was that the boys as young as two years of age were given miniature but functional bow and arrows. Oh, the fun I would have! Another role that the men did was flint nap. Flint napping is a technique used to chip away a rock to make weapons and tools. It takes a lot of precision and patience, and time. I had the privilege of learning the start at Fort Edmonton Park. I had such a wonderful teacher. How about clothes? Basically, all the clothes they wore were made of animal hides, furs, and sometimes even woven grass mats. The clothes they wore depended on not only what was in their environment, but also the climate they lived in. A cool fact we learned at Fort Edmonton Park was about the bone breastplate worn by the men. They were either made of rare hair pipe bones from bison or birds or otter skin covered with porcupine quills. Were they used in warfare? Nope. Arrows could easily pass through. They were used though in ceremonial dances and guess what the number of bones on the plates meant? The wealth of a warrior. Yep, because the bones were hard to come by. I'm getting a little hungry now. Let's talk food. Basically, their diets consisted of meat, some sort of wild vegetables, plants or roots, fruits, mosses, even pemmican and some form of bread. If they did not grow a certain food in their territory, they could trade for it. Some of the plants and mosses were for eating, and some were actually medicinal, as our slideshow covers. Bannock! What about Bannock? Don't panic. Bannock actually came later with the Europeans. It's Scottish. Mmm, Bannock. 
The best band the guy ever had was from a lovely lady at the Cree camp at Fort Edmonton Park. She made hers with cinnamon and sugar and deep fried it. Mmm, sorry, Mom. Hey, look, are those bison or buffalo? They are bison. Yep, the word buffalo is actually incorrect for these big, beautiful animals. One theory is that the Europeans thought they resembled the buffalo in Asia and Africa, so they called them buffalo. The other theory is that the word came from the French word boeuf, meaning ox or bullock. What did you learn about the bison at the Métis camp at Fort Edmonton Park? The indigenous people used all parts of the bison. The hide was for teepees and clothes, sinew was thread, intestines were containers, bones for weapons, tails for fly swatters, boop for fuel when the food was when wood was scarce, and of course meat to eat like bison jerky. Mm. We also have some interesting information on our slideshow about the about how they used a bison pound and how they hunted the pronghorn and even camel in pre-contact times. That's really cool. Now, let's talk about how they prepared the hides. We learned that there are two ways that a hide can be prepared. One is scraped and dried. This hide would be stiff. The other way would be to brain tan it. This is a long, laborious job, but well worth it. I will skip the details, as some of you may have just eaten. At the end of this process, you will have a soft, flexible hide, even when it gets wet. Now, I did have the privilege of helping in scraping a hide at Fort Edmonton Park. It was hard work. It required a lot of arm and back muscles, and bison hair flies everywhere. Scraping the fleshy side of the hide? Well, we will let you read about it in our slideshow. Matthew, you love dancing. Why don't you tell us about their dancing? The indigenous people love dancing to the beat of a drum. Through dancing and singing, they celebrate their traditions. They're even used to tell stories and are used in healing ceremonies. The powwow consists of so many different dances, as their slideshow covers. Interestingly, powwows were post-contact. We learned at the Silver Skate Festival that some songs and dances were serious, some songs were owned by the singer, and some dances were either done by men and boys or women and girls. We also had the privilege of being a part of a round dance at the Silver Skate Festival. It was so much fun. We all danced around in a circle and we really felt connected to each other. The drummers were awesome and funny too. Good news is that they did the singing, not my mom. Stories were very important to the indigenous people. This was the way they could pass on their history orally. Some stories were funny and for entertainment. Some stories were given to them in dreams and were owned. That meant if someone heard a story, they did not have the right to retell it. After all the hunting was done and the meat and vegetables were preserved and the herbs gathered, they would then sit and tell stories through the winter months. Well, since they did not have TV or video games, sitting in a nice warm teepee telling stories and eating bison meat sounds great. Well, that teepee that they are sitting in may have had drawings on it. Through dreams or visions, they received inspiration for designs that showed events of humans, birds, or animals. This showed that they valued art. Now, let's talk games. Games were not only entertainment, but they also helped children develop mentally and physically. The games taught them how to hunt, fish, and solve problems. Some games even had religious meanings. Also, because symbols were used in some games, they could be played among different nations who did not speak the same language. Now, a game our family came to learn and love is Wei Pitiso Wei Wei Pahigan, or Double Ball. I love that game. It starts out as Double Ball, played by throwing a ball to each other in the air, then somehow turns into hockey. It definitely gets competitive. What, what we, we learned. learned. The indigenous people had strong, loving families. All the members of the community were responsible for educating the children. We also learned how the indigenous people were mistreated post-contact. Please view our slideshow that not only talks about reserves, but also about a past system that they had to follow. 
One of the saddest events we learned about was the residential school system and how the Europeans wanted to kill the Indian and the child. Complete assimilation. We do encourage you to view our slideshow post-contact. Some of the information is very sensitive, but important to view. We hope this information may help eliminate the stereotyping of Indigenous people today. We also want to thank all of the people that answered our questions at the different events we attended. They have all been knowledgeable and fun to talk to. Kawapuntan Keetwan! That means I will see you again in Cree.